core of the pyramid of getting these things done is having good public policy, you know, advocating for walkability and quiet streets and speed limits and safe pedestrian crossings. And then what you need to do, I think, is round up champions who are going to take this through the process. And a lot of times those are business leaders. They may be politicians uh, who are going to give you some wind at your back when you go to the various agency people. Uh, I mentioned think beyond silo thinking, build partnerships with people in the health community. Uh, that's got to be a huge emphasis. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman, and that is Bob Cerns, the author of the recent book, uh, Beyond Greenways, The Next Step for City Trails and Walking Routes, uh, published by Island Press. Uh, we have a fabulous conversation. I can't wait to share it with you. So let's get right to it with Bob. Bob Cerns, thank you so much for joining me in the Active Towns podcast. Oh, well, thank you, John. It's great to be with you. Thanks. Well, Bob, uh, one of the things that I love doing with the uh, Active Towns podcast is giving my guests a, an opportunity just to quickly introduce themselves. So who is Bob Cerns? <laughs> well, a lot of things. Um, right now, at this point in my life, I'm a bar band musician by night, and uh, I've taken up a new career as an aspiring writer by day. And uh, kind of going back before that, I have been a, I like to call it a developer of greenways, urban greenways, trails, uh, open space conservation projects, things along that line. I did that for about, uh, oh God, four or five decades really now. So that's, that's my background. And when I say developer, what I mean is it's somebody who puts an idea together, maybe producer's a better word, puts an idea together and then gets a plan done, goes out and finds the money, secures the right of way, uh, organizes uh, teams and gets projects built. So um, as I say, I've done that for a, a whole lot of decades and um, that's, that's uh, where I'm at now and what I, what I have been doing. Fantastic. Okay. Well, you, you, you slipped something in there that sounded fun. Tell me more about the musician stuff. Well, um, yeah, I, uh, well, about 15, uh, well, longer. I started playing guitar and bass in high school. And uh, about 15 years ago, I kind of fell in with some other musicians. And uh, we uh, put together a classic blues, uh, Delta Blues and classic American rock band. And we play in the uh, various uh, uh, entertainment venues, the, the bars, the pubs, uh, uh, restaurants and that sort of thing around, uh, you know, the Denver metro area. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun doing that. Fantastic. That's great. Yeah. Before we hit the record button, I was telling you a little bit about that. I have a, a, a pretty deep history with the uh, the Front Range area there. I lived in Boulder for about a decade. And, and for a few years, I worked in downtown Denver and would ride the express bus, uh, you know, down to downtown Denver and all that. So I'm sure uh, the, the the Front Range, the, the Boulder, Denver area will come up in our conversations. Uh, but one of the things and the reason why we are chatting today is because from that experience that you've had and the work that you had been doing previously and developing and putting together uh, greenways and pathways and things like that, you have published a fabulous new book. Uh, talk a little bit about the inspiration uh, behind this book, Beyond Greenways, The Next Step for City Trails and Walking Routes. Yeah, this inspiration came from a few places. It, it was kind of a point in my life, uh, you know, maybe it was actually six, seven years ago. I, as I mentioned, I'd been building trails and greenways for a whole lot of years. And I kind of wondered, what are some next steps? You know, where do I want to go? What do I want to do with it? And I happened to be invited to a trails conference, an international conference on Jeju Island, which is a, a Maui-sized island off the coast of uh, uh, South Korea. It's part of South Korea. And at the conference, there was an emphasis on uh, creating walking routes. And really even more exciting than that is Cheju has a loop trail that goes around the edges of the island. It's 
you know, it's a couple hundred miles really long uh, where the island meets the seashore. So on one side, you got kind of the wilderness of the sea. And the other side, you have a number of towns and hamlets along the way. So you can walk from place to place. Uh, spend the night. There's even what they call them, these grannies, they, the term they use that run these B&Bs where you can stay. And I, I just got really inspired by that idea as I was trying to figure out, well, what's the next direction for me and maybe for Greenways? And so that notion of these uh, walking routes inspired me. Uh, I took it back to Denver with me and actually got together with a number of friends and two dogs. And we walked around, we decided to walk around the edges of Denver to kind of map out a a Cheju Island type route, you know, maybe 150 mile route around the edges of metropolitan Denver, where the city meets the countryside to see what that would be like. And connected with that, there's another, another prong to this, uh, this two-pronged uh, approach is uh, around that time, I was also wrapping up a plan for Commerce City, Colorado, which is a, uh, well, it was largely a working class suburb uh, just on the north uh, uh, east side of, of Denver. And they had a project, we called it the Walk, Bike, Fit Plan. And a number of uh, health people, it was actually Tri-County Health at the time, sponsored this and and their emphasis, you know, part of it was recreation, of course, but a big part of it was health and fitness and dealing with uh, kind of the, the, it's almost the epidemic proportion. Well, it is an epidemic proportion of of obesity and cardiovascular problems and, and all those kinds of things that were coming from a sedentary lifestyle. So, that journey was to figure out how to promote routine, you know, day-to-day fitness activity to get people healthier. And there was kind of an epiphanal moment at that, at one of the public meetings, two um, older ladies from the community came up and they said to me, we just want a place to walk, you know, where we can we don't have to dodge garbage cans in the street. We don't have to dodge bicyclists uh, coming past, past us at a high speed on a bike path. This is nothing negative about bikes, but this is the kind of space they wanted, just that tranquil setting of readily accessible close-in walking. So that kind of was the second part of the epiphany. So in addition to the grand walk around Denver, uh, my wife and I, and sometimes my kids, we would get together and we would walk these loops in town, in the suburbs, in the different communities, in the, in the urban area, and we would walk these three to six mile walks uh, through urban areas. In, and the geometry was always a loop, you know, kind of starting out, going around an area, point to point, and coming back to the point of beginning. So those two components became kind of what I started to think about, and, and some of my urban planning and greenway planning I had done before, We, on a number of occasions, we had proposed loops around the edges of communities as part of a trails plan, but I decided to kind of brand that as grand loops, the ones around the outer edges, like Sheju Island or the one we walked around Denver, and then the ones in town I called town walks. And so that came together as kind of these two elements of this kind of a little bit new geometry of greenways. Uh, Greenways tend to, and rail trails tend to follow the grain of the environment. Uh, You know, they follow a a stream valley or a rail corridor, they're linear, they tend to be grade separated. Whereas loops, you know, really almost go against the grain, you overlay them. And the, the geometry of the loop is more important. And in a way, the idea was to expand and uh, make accessibility more equitable to places to, you know, walk. Biking, biking can be part of it too. I'm not, I'm not uh, dissing bicycling, but at least you could just go out with a pair of shoes or in your bare feet if you want. You didn't need any special equipment to kind of use these kinds of facilities. So that's, that's how, how it evolved. Yeah. I'm pausing on this particular image because this image more than any of the others uh, really sort of 
brings that experience that you had in South Korea on the island to life in my mind. As I was reading it, I'm going, then I saw this and I'm like, oh yeah, that's kind of like what Bob was talking about. It was like this, you know, relatively narrow sort of a walking environment, natural surface, maybe not completely, but you know, much of the way. Um, And so I think that this is a really nice image to kind of set this up is that yes, there's a lot of flexibility that we'll be talking about, like with these grand loops and these city walks where you're going to have a multitude of different surfaces. But uh, uh, yeah, that initial seed, this this image sort of, you know, popped in my mind. Is that kind of an, a, a relatively cr- uh, close assumption there? Yeah, I'm glad you put that image up, John, because when I say walking, uh, you know, walking is defined as a number of types of movement. Uh, and particularly in, in writing the book, I, I interviewed runners, uh, you know, extreme athletes. Um, and uh, so it really impl- it implies any kind of foot movement uh, on a path or even traveling with uh, enabled with a wheelchair, too. In, in, right. In, yeah. I was you know, just going to mention yeah. that, too, because that's one of the one of the things that we talk about on the Active Towns channel a lot is is, you know, an all ages and all abilities sort of approach at things. Within reason, obviously, yeah. Yeah, I, I consider rolling along with a wheelchair or, or using an ass, other types of assisted devices walking as well. Right, yeah, okay, sure. good. Just want to make sure we clarify that, yeah, fantastic. So, yeah, and, and really, I, I want to come to what you have described as, uh, you know, the, these two elements, and you just mentioned the Grand Loop Trails and uh, also the, the Town Walks, and there, there's... I, I hadn't realized that you had done a Grand Loop Trail uh, around Denver. Now that that has to be a big loop. Well, we did. I we haven't built it yet. Uh, yeah, I yeah, no, I know, I know. But yeah. you guys, yeah, you yeah, guys yeah. have like figured it out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how many miles yeah. would that be all around Denver? Oh, it could vary from 120 to 150 or longer. I actually did do a concept plan. The Colorado Parks Foundation. Uh, very, and the Greenway Foundation of Denver very kindly gave me a grant, and I did write up a concept plan. And actually, this this loop around Denver is, by and large, significantly in place. It's partly by happenstance. It's also partly in the process of developing the concept plan. I went out to all the jurisdictions around Denver and talked to the people there, and they all pretty much enthusiastically embraced the idea of connectivity. And it turns out that these this loop is sort of happening even without a grand master plan there's a concept plan that i did but i'd say 40 percent of it is in place as a as a very walkable trails and other parts you're walking on country roads but you you, you can go out right now and walk all the way around the edges of because we did it you know just just like we did it can be done and i think that's a good thing to to interject is that yeah it's uh, because you made the the comment, oh, we haven't built it yet. But at the same time, you can link these things together, and that's kind of a little bit about the spirit of the book. Is it? There, it's it's sort of half of a, a cookbook for for how you can plan these out and then build them when you need to build them. But in 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 another way, it's like, oh, by the way, you could probably go out and do a good portion of this, if not the entire thing, now. Yeah, there's different levels of, of development from just an idea that people go out and walk to something that's formally in place. I might add that when I started working on the book and st- started researching this and talking to people about it, you know, I thought, oh, well, this is a crazy idea. But then I discovered there's one around Phoenix. They're building one around Las Vegas. There, there's one in development uh, around Louisville, Kentucky, and Paris is talking about a loop. So actually, you know, people were building these before you know, this idea came to my head. So it turned out there are a number of places are actually doing it. So in some ways, I'm also documenting in the book people who have done this or are working on doing this. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, the the other thing that is identified and, and mentioned here on this slide is, again, what you had mentioned uh, as well, or more of these these town walks and these loops that you're doing within the na- the, the neighborhoods, um, and and again, this is something that in in many cases, most cases, you can probably cobble this together already with what's in your neighborhood. 
That's that's kind of the the beauty of it is that that you you can do that. Um, there's different levels that I've thought about for town walks, and and by the way, other people have done those too before I even thought about it. I just put a brand on it. But one of the things about this is that ideally you're shooting for a high quality experience like the picture shows. That shows the key characteristics of a complete street where you see a nice walking surface, you see a tree median, there's shade, it's a great experience, there's separation from the traffic. So that's kind of the ideal of, of what it can be. But there's also a lot of flexibility in the same way. You can, you can walk in, in a lot of ways. You can walk on a back street, not a back street, but a local street in a community too. So yeah, I think that's that, that, that does kind of that was sort of the ideal uh, town walk. And I also see those as overlay parks in a way. They're at different levels, like community or local or neighborhood. You can can do these branded walks in the same way. Yeah. And the way you were describing, uh, you know, the, the, the city walks and the little neighborhood walks and everything definitely fits into your diagram here of the gr- Grand Loop uh, trail configuration. We, we have, you know, obviously when you look at, you know, where the city meets the countryside and in creating that grand loop, you're on the edges there, ideally. Um, and, and, and interestingly enough, I can tell is through reading the book too, that, um, again, there's a good likelihood that some of this infrastructure, if not a lot of this infrastructure is already built, uh, because you get lots of, of trails out on the fringes out there, as well as, as you just mentioned, maybe it's a a quieter, uh, farm road or country road, um, out there on the edge. But one of the things that's really cool too, is this daisy chain kind of look of it here down in the bottom right of this graphic is where you might be able to loop some of those neighborhoods neighborhood loops into a, a grand loop configuration and scheme. Yeah. And that, that idea, actually, I went, you know, I mentioned, I, as I was uh, kind of promoting the idea of a grand loop around Denver, I went to the city of Boulder open space uh, department and made a presentation. And one of the planners there came up and suggested that idea of those loops. And then it was also added to, I presented somewhere else and a mountain biker advocate came up and said, it'd really be nice if we maybe had little attached mountain biking loops or or maybe equestrian loops that were attached. So that's how that that daisy chain evolved is by taking this idea on the road and getting input from people like uh, Boulder, you know, Boulder Open Space and, and some of the mountain biking organizations. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it's interesting too. The uh, one of my very dear friends uh, there in Boulder um, is uh, Darcy Kitching, and so she has actually written a book, um, the 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 best urban hiking guides uh, for Boulder. And then every year, with part of her walking group that she she has there in in Boulder, uh, she which is kind of a spinoff of the. Um, a walk to connect group um, that Jonathan, you know, had there in, in yeah, the I Denver know Jonathan. area. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah, him. exactly. Oh. And so one of the annual uh, events that Darcy puts together with her walking group that, and it may, might actually be identified and highlighted in this particular uh, best urban hikes uh, book uh, that was published by the Colorado mountain club press is a, th- a walk 360 around the entire uh, uh, entirety of Boulder. And so they have a route that they've done uh, every year annually for the past, I, w- I want to say four or five years. I've actually joined them one of the years and filmed the entire event. So that's available out here on the YouTube channel. So folks, if you haven't watched that, be sure to check that out. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, it, but what's really neat is, is it, it's bringing to life exactly what you were highlighting in the book is that, you know, it, it was cobbled together with kind of what is on there. And what's brilliant about it, because it, it, it does something similar in that it's many different types of trails, types of pathways. Sometimes you're on a quiet street, but you're able to, to actually adjust it based on, hey, what's going to be the most pleasurable route? versus what's going to just get the job done. So I think that's rather brilliant in terms of how you framed it and 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 also the spirit of well if that connection's not here yet, okay, how do we get the community together 
get some support behind, okay, well, how do we, how do we close this gap so that we could create this rather meaningful either Grand Loop or City Walk that, you know, residents and visitors alike will really enjoy? Yeah, I think Darcy's kind of, uh, she's hit on the citizen starting point, I think, of a lot of these kinds of things that you can maybe, and there's urban hiking organizations too, you start maybe with a semi-virtual, semi-established thing, and that image gets there, and then you can upgrade it over time. Um, but but I'm glad you mentioned the experience is key. Safety and the experience are, are, are the two leading things, I think, in thinking about these. Yeah, yeah. And it is interesting, too, that uh, you've mentioned the Paris and the Coulee Verte that they have developed uh, over the many, many years there. I was just there in um, November of last year and had the opportunity to explore quite a few of the extensive network of, of trails that they've been putting together. And so I do have uh, some videos that I've produced on that. Uh, and in this this particular image really highlights the fact that they're converting a lot of their old uh, abandoned rail areas uh, to be able to facilitate those, you know, those experiences. Yeah, this one could really be something. It's not built yet, but there's a strong advocacy movement. There's some resistance like anything, but I really hope they do achieve that. I think that would be a wonderful amenity and overlay kind of regional park really for, for Paris. It'd be wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So when we are, and in fact, let, let's go ahead and, and, and pull this out because I think, believe, believe this is the, the image of, of Paris and that, yeah, so that's all right, right there. Yeah, that is fantastic. I'm, I'm relatively certain that I have been on portions of it that have already been uh, developed at this point. And they really do see it as like a chain of, of, uh, greenways that connect other parks and speak to that a little bit, because I think that's a part of what you were uh, addressing in the book as well, is this could be an opportunity against the grain to be able to connect many other green spaces as well as, uh, you know, other key destinations like shopping areas and, and, and other places like that. Yeah, that's, that's another, as you say, it's a key element of thinking about this in the experience. And uh, there's different terms that different uh, designers have used. Uh, places and links is one of them. I like to call them waypoints also. That you, you know, on, on a loop like that, when you just showed around Paris or the one they're proposing around downtown Denver or one of, the one we talked about, the Grand Loop, um, is that maybe with a certain spacing of, of maybe an hour's walk or whatever, even less, you go from an open space to another open space or maybe from a civic or iconic view to another destination like that. But it could also be more rudimentary kind of destinations, like maybe it's just a coffee shop where you can reward yourself or a restaurant. You know, you walk around a loop you get all that exercise, you can kind of eat with impunity. So um, I think you, you always have to think about these as kind of a, a charm bracelet and having those little mini destinations along the way to, to make these kinds of loops really work is a nice organized piece of entertainment. Yeah. And this image really drives home for me uh, part of the reason why <laughs> you're, you're even considering this. And this is, this is not unique to the Front Ridge of Colorado. I, and many other places around the world are, are noticing that a big part of our challenge is that our desirable outdoor destinations are getting increasingly crowded, as well as just the less than desirable experience even getting there. And so creating more opportunities within our own communities to be able to, as you mentioned earlier, just outside your door, being able to access some meaningful, pleasurable experiences that you can walk on. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's both convenient access and equitable access that it gives more people, you know, ideally these, the Grand Loops are at the end of the transit lines. And there's been a transit to trails program in a number of cities where you can take public transportation and get out to the edge and be in kind of a semi-wild kind of place. Or 
you can, you know, the ride share services, I've, I've kind of utilized them in, in my walk. So, and, and the time element just of, it's more convenient to get out there as well. And there's one other factor I'll throw in about that. When you're doing a loop around the edges of a, a city, for example, there's there's another uh, genre of what's called ultralight hiking, where you don't need a backpack and fancy, heavy, uh, expensive equipment. It's a, These are day pack walks, but they can be treks because many times on the edges of cities, you have little towns and hamlets and other places where there's a B&B or a campground or a place where you can spend the night. There are restaurants along the way or convenience stores. So you you know, you know, want to carry some water, and I can go into more detail about all of that, what you carry with you. But you're able to have sort of a semi-wilderness experience without carrying a 60-pound backpack and freeze-dried food and all that. Not that I'm knocking the alternative. It's lightweight travel. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that too, but not only just the, the, the lightweight travel concept, but also how uh, you, you outline this in the book, how you are leveraging those other uh, mobility services, uh, whether it's transit or ride share to be able to cobble together, uh, you know, that experience for you. And, and that's a, another good thing to point out too, especially with some of these, uh, grand loop ideas, maybe a, a person decides to, you know, I'm going to walk the whole way around, uh, Denver, Colorado, or wherever, but you don't do it all necessarily in one go. Maybe you do a segment of it and then say, okay, cool. You know, that I, I put in my eight hours of, or six hours or four hours or whatever you want to do for that day. And you either jump on transit or, you know, hail a cab slash ride share, or maybe a friend picks you up or something. And you can actually, you know, have that sense of adventure of being able to cobble something together uh, without, as you mentioned, you know, necessarily having to, you know, carry enough gear uh, to be able to camp overnight. Again, nothing wrong with that, but, you know, this gives you a little bit more flexibility. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's a lightweight way to go. And, uh, you know, I think there's a tourism aspect to it. If you, if you imagine, you know, we talked about the loop in Paris or a loop around uh, London or somewhere, it's maybe you go and you take a trek and maybe it's, Maybe you take, well, I, I did one around Buffalo I'll talk about later, but you walk around the whole city uh, and you've come there from, you live in Denver, you've gone to London. It's a way to experience the English countryside and maybe you stay in places all the way around. In fact, there's just a story in the New York Times about a woman uh, who just put out a guidebook to doing these loop walks in London. But you can you can just take a backpack and even spend the night all the way around, or like you said, or, or go into town each day and then come back again. Yeah, yeah. And I want to hone in and emphasize the, the fact that, you know, what we are, again, talking about here is, you know, creating that network of locally accessible paths and trails. And again, in many cases, they may be out there already. And it's just a, ba- a matter of linking them together, you know, and, and basically uh, highlighting the fact that, oh, did you know, by the way, you can access this and being able to identify which ones are going to be truly accessible, you know, for all ages and abilities. And, and as you're phrasing it here, a diverse, equitable access approach to things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just, in some ways, it's about coaxing these roots out of the environment, finding them, and maybe you maybe you have to improve a segment, or if there's a big barrier somewhere, maybe it's just simply like a freeway, maybe it's just crossing that barrier with a, with a pedestrian bridge or something, and that, that opens up maybe 50 miles of new territory because you crossed one barrier, you know, so that's part of that coaxing out. Uh, process uh, of these creating these kinds of amenities. Yeah. And getting back to that experience, creating experience that is really pleasurable and enjoyable. And, uh, and I think really kind of helps to, you know, separate this from just a utilitarian pathway that may not be the most enjoyable environment, but it gets the job done. And, you know, from an active mobility perspective, it's like, yeah, okay, 
it, this is a pathway next to a, an interstate and, you know, it, it, it's not a very pleasurable experience. But this particular um, diagram that you have in the book uh, really, I think, helped identify and highlight how incredibly important it is to to have a, a good understanding of what the pathways of perception are and the stuff that's happening at the, the fine grain as well as the things that are further out, like the skylines and the long views. Right. Yeah, I think if, if, if you're going to lay something like that this out, the key is to get inside the head of the user, which means really, you really need to go out there and walk it and use your five senses. What does it sound like, smell like, look like? Uh, and the thing I began to learn when I was doing these walks uh, around Denver and some of the places and in my Greenway planning all over the, the country is that if you can create a, a space, even if there's a steel mill, you know, maybe a quarter mile away, if you can create some tree cover and some canopy and screen, you, you, you can have a different experience that you can feel like you're in a wild area. And, and I learned that from my Greenway work too, that, that as I was saying, that those are the kinds of things you can do. And in addition, you do want to find those opportunities for those long views, those vistas. You want to try and preserve those as well, but don't be inhibited by the fact that a portion of the trail might go through uh, something that's not always a b beautiful wilderness. In fact, part of what I learned, and I, I did this walk around Buffalo that I'll talk about later, I learned that it's kind of nice to have that variety of kind of those rural experiences. And then maybe you go through an urban scape where there's, even there's graffiti on the wall that might be interesting. You know, there's, there's different, um, it, it's really, it, it's like composing a song. It's, or writing a book or a movie, it's really a series of experiences that are entertain, entertaining. And I, I'd say I'm more in the entertainment business than the transportation business, not that I haven't been involved in, you know, trying to promote alternative uh, active travel, but the emphasis of Beyond Greenways is really entertainment. Yeah. And you just mentioned that uh, you did uh, just do a trek around uh, Buff Buffalo, New York. Talk a little bit about the inspiration for uh, wanting to do this, because this is just recently. This is just a couple months ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, when I when I finished the book in, in chapter eight of the book, I, I did a series of thought exper experiments. Uh, and I know there's some that exist in some cities, but I wanted to try to overlay the idea on some other communities of different character and location uh, to see what you could imagine. And so Buffalo is, you know, it's a Rust Belt city. It's kind of emerging from a, you know, the, the nickname is the city of no illusions for many years. It was just kind of, oh, who would want to go to Buffalo? And so I, I said, well, let's, let's look at Buffalo and see what you could do. And I discovered that there's some really beautiful, iconic places around the edges of Buffalo, not the least of which is Niagara Falls, I might add. So I, I kind of plotted out a thought exper experiment. And then after the book came out, I said, well, I better put my feet where my mouth is. So I, I uh, plotted a, a route and uh, walked all the way around Buffalo. It turned out it was about 120 miles. And it was just an incredible experience. I had no idea of the kind of spaces, you know, everybody thinks, oh, it's a you know, steel mill town or whatever. The kind of spaces that are on the edges and a lot of other cities like this, Pittsburgh, uh, Boston, all these, Detroit, they all have these kind of spaces out on the edges and they're not very hard to get to. Uh, so I, I did the walk, walked all the way around. And part of it, I spent the night out there at different B&Bs. As I mentioned, I just carried a day pack. In other instances, I used the rideshare services, and I have a nephew who lives there. I went back at night and spent the night at his house and then went back out to the loop again and walked the next day. So it was kind of a combination of that way of getting all the way around Buffalo. Fantastic. And, and we see a, a couple collages of some of the beautiful images Uh that you had, uh, you know, from that. And then we shift into, uh, you know, some of the lessons learned. Um, we'll, we'll get, we'll get to that in just a bit, but I want to reflect on the fact that uh, I did something similar, uh, but on bike, uh, the last time I was in Buffalo was, uh, for the Congress for the new urbanism, uh, annual gathering was in, in Buffalo a few years back. 
And my good friend Victor Dover and I decided uh, that we would go for a bike ride. And so we rode our bikes from Buffalo uh, to Chautauqua. And so because the original Chautauqua in New York is is there within riding distance of, of, of Buffalo. And it was just really fascinating to see, you know, you know, you go through the grittiness of that, you know, it rust belt industrial portion, you get to the edge and then you get out into the countryside. And we went through several little villages and towns. And whether you're you're doing a slow bike ride like we were doing, because we're not going very fast um, or you're, you're going for a walk. Uh, part of the par, part of that process, part of that experience, you called it entertainment, but I I, I kind of even uh, say it's even more rich than that. It's it's an experience. You're experiencing life at a slower pace. You know, Jonathan with Walk to Neck, you know, emphasizes that you're 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 feeling a, a life at three miles per hour. It's very very intimate what you see. Talk a little bit about that because I think that also kind of of goes into some of the things that we're going to see here on the the lessons learned is that you are experiencing this at a much more intimate uh, rate of and pace. Oh yeah. And, and you know, the entertainment part, I'm, I'm taking, I'm being a little lightweight on that. It really is a, a spiritual and meditative experience. Just, you know, when you get into walking, there's just that repetitive motion that kind of gets the serotonin loops going in your head and the meditate, you know, a lot of the meditative kind of religions involve kind of a repetitive chant or repetitive motion. So you kind of get in that kind of mindset inside your body that you clear your mind plus the space you're in you know you know especially in the rural areas but it can be in an urban area too the, the sense the sound so yeah it, it's really way beyond just entertainment it is it is a it is a, a mental experience and a, a spiritual experience and of course we know there are some spiritual trails like that like the Camino de Santiago uh, goes you know goes across uh, northern Spain and then there's the uh, Kamano Koto which is a religious kind of meditative trail in Japan in kind of the hill country south of Osaka so there are a number of these kinds of destinations and I've I'm actually planning to write a piece about spiritual trails maybe linking together I noticed an article about these prayer houses in the southeast and and what if you link those together there are these places uh, they started in the slavery era and then in the black community they remained where people would gather for spiritual gatherings. But what if you started to link these historic places together? So there's all these different types of levels and pilgrimage trips uh, that are part of it. Yeah. Now we're on the lessons learned slide here. And, uh, I, and I find it, uh, I, I, I haven't a question about this, this particular slide, given the context of, of this slide right here saying, we're going to, all right, we're going to walk the talk here. We're going to get out there and do it. We've written the book. Uh, did you have any surprises, any additions to the bullet points in lessons learned after you did the, bu- the Buffalo? Oh yeah. And this is why I urge planners go out and walk your route. Yeah, don't don't just put it on a map. Uh, yeah, there were a number of lessons. Obviously, the first one when I plotted this thing, you know, the devil is always in the details. You know, so when I started doing it, Google Maps, I, it would have been very hard to do it without Google Maps. I tried on a paper map too, but the nice thing about Google Maps is that you can kind of find those waypoints that I mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, because you, when you go on a trip like this on foot, particularly. Uh, and I'm just some old guy walking alone. You know, you you, you got to find places to eat and drink, to sleep, to duck out if a storm comes. And what a lot of people don't think about is you have to go to the bathroom. You know, what 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 are you going to do? And, you know, these days, sadly, in America, other countries, maybe it's a little different. You can't just safely, comfortably go knock on someone's door. You need to plot those things. And Google Maps really helped with that. I, I call it the, the Tim Hortons planning technique. Uh, Tim Hortons is kind of a the they're popular in Buffalo. They're kind of the Buffalo equivalent of Starbucks. But I started finding all the Tim Hortons and connecting them together because I knew that Tim Hortons, you could go get coffee or, you know, something to eat or, or and use the bathroom. It turned out I, I didn't actually <laughs> Don't, don't anybody Tim Hortons get mad at me. I didn't actually go into any Tim Hortons, but I just, because there are other ways I solved the problem, but just knowing they were there 
gave me that that way of plotting a route. And Google helped me find those. I would just put coffee shops in or restaurants in, and then I would find those. I also found, and this is speaking for myself, there are other people who might want to go longer. I'm in pretty good shape, but uh, you know, a 10 to 12 mile uh, walk is pretty optimal. When I was training for this, uh, I walked, you'll, you'll, you'll know this, I live in the Ken Carroll area, I walked to Golden's 15 miles. It was 90 degree weather. And I was really hurting at the end of that walk. And, you know, just because it was a little too long in the heat. Um, so I, I began to find for me, uh, or the lay kind of hiker, you know, oh, 10, 12 miles is probably optimal. Uh, and it's, it's leisurely, you can stop and rest along the way and that kind of thing. I did one 16 mile length when I did the Buffalo walk, but I, I found it 10 to 12 miles was nice. And then you just kind of hunker down for the night, wherever you're going to stay and just enjoy and relish the day. So that was very helpful. The other thing I'll add is I mentioned waypoints is that if you plot one of these, you really want to figure those out and they give you kind of a reward. There's kind of the beginning of the journey in the morning and the end at the end of the day, but there's little, maybe it's a church or maybe it's a iconic site or an overlook. They give you something to get you through each hour to kind of do it. And then the technology, the ride share technology, a lot of this kind of thing wouldn't be possible or as easy. It would be possible. It wouldn't have been as easy as is now because of things like Lyft and Uber, which I used a lot because then you can just, you, you, at the end of the day, or if it starts raining or whatever, you can call and go back to where you're staying if you have to. I, you know, I tried to not use those facilities if I could get somewhere on foot, but I had that out. One thing I learned that surprised me and disappointed me a little bit is country roads can, at least around Buffalo, can be busy. So you need to anticipate that. We, we, my nephew walked with me for some of this when I say we. We always walked facing the traffic so we could see the cars coming. So I, didn't think, I don't think it was very dangerous. We could see them coming. But sometimes in some of the roads, there was, that noise was a little bit of an annoyance. And so ultimately, it'd be nice to in Buffalo, and I've talked to people in Buffalo, to eventually provide separated trails that parallel these routes. Uh, other places, there are lots of back roads. It depends on the community. And then, you know, just little things like checking, you know, a lot of lodging places, you can't check in until three. So... Uh, and you got to check out by 10 or 11. So you got to put that into your equation too, to not get somewhere too early. Cell phone, an extra battery, if you're going to do this, yeah, you want to carry that because you're, that you're kind of, your life can be dependent on having that cell phone. And then the prepping the trek, I tried to get my weight down to 15 pounds. You know, actually the heaviest thing was water. Uh, so that was a real learning experience in doing this, in, you know, getting out there on foot and walking Buffalo. And then we talked about the idea of the experience, it being a high quality experience and that it doesn't always have to be green. It can be uh, these urban spaces as well. We talked about the destinations and waypoints. I like to think it's sometimes in terms of character districts, they're different rooms that you walk through. Uh, Grant Jones, uh, he's just a wonderful landscape architect who he's the first guy I heard use that term uh, that maybe you're walking through a kind of a very green space or may, you know an industrial space you can actually begin to name those districts if you're plotting with these and there are different bubbles that you walk through that have different character and you know, safety and security is pretty obvious I hope but you want to consider weather when you think about that it's key. And, you know, and then, of course, as I mentioned, the Tim Hortons theory that you or the 7-Eleven theory that you think about where you're going to get your provisions and find toilets. You know, so right. th yeah. those are some things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that it really is interesting. You, there, there is a couple more things, uh, you know, on, on this uh, in terms of planning the route. And it, one of the things that I, I think is really important here is. I, I'm with you. I think it'd be wonderful if we saw more of those sort of parallel routes to some of these country roads, because some of these are just absolutely delightful 
spaces that they're going through. But yeah, especially with the pressure of exurban sprawl and developments happening, you're seeing more and more uh, you know, motor vehicles on there. So being able to have an off street version, which is what I run into a lot in the Netherlands is that, you know, pretty much anywhere I want to go, any city, I know that I can jump on my bike uh, or walk or run, uh, you know, from a, a village to a village on a separated pathway, you know, and sometimes it's, it's parallel to the train track. Sometimes it's parallel to uh, a, a country road, but yeah, it's something that I think North America would be well served to have because oftentimes there's the right of way. Sometimes there's not, but oftentimes there is, it would be nice to have an off street version. Oh yeah. I think, it, you know, it's a policy kind of thing that we need policy that promotes walking everywhere. And, you know, one of the things I noticed walking around Buffalo there, I wasn't the only one walking in the road. There are a lot of other people, locals who are walking in the road and it, it should be just a policy. When you lay out a road, it's not just for the cars, provide that separated space for foot travel and, and allow for bike travel too, you know, to, to do that. You know, the other things that are showing up on the slide, I think, is the, you know, and I was, this is Buffalo Creek in that picture. I didn't even know about Buffalo Creek. I just happened to cross a bridge. I said, wow. But I realized this particular creek corridor, there are a number of them like this, those could be links um, along the way. Uh, and not only for uh, maybe having a trail, but also to the, the planners and designers in the Buffalo areas to think about preserving these areas to become part of, you know, the Greenbelt notion. So, so sort of when you see those, take advantage of them, but, but unlike a Greenway, string maybe several of them together into a loop, which, you know, in Shoreline, same thing, Lake Erie Shore, uh, you know, was another uh, opportunity there. Yeah, yeah. The, the other thing that I think is important, too, and I'm going to pull this up, uh, the adapt existing uh, infrastructure slide, um, because one of the things that you just said about, you know, talking about, you know, the political will and the policies in place to be able to you know, provide you know, separated facilities, we do realize that oftentimes um we will have a situation where we're walking in the street. I mean, I live in a neighborhood uh, that was platted out in the 1920s, 1930s, and was built out in the 1940s, immediately after World War II. So we have no sidewalks. And so every street is a shared street. And we're kind of cool with that at this point, because everybody is so used to walking in the street and running in the street and riding bikes in the streets and walking your dogs in the street, that it's a, it's a traffic calmed environment. And so the motor vehicle drivers in the neighborhood know that, oh yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, if I go down this stretch on Garner, I'm going to, you know, come across at least 10 to 12 people walking in the neighborhood, which really reminds me of the image that we see here on the left in this is adapting and using the infrastructure. But context is incredibly important because two blocks over, I have, you know, a classic Strode in Lamar Boulevard. And no one would walk. <laughs> There's actually sidewalks there, but you wouldn't even want to walk there because it's a, you know, a, a very unattractive environment, hostile environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that and I think that picture is that uh, that happens to be in Denver, but those kind of streets are all over the place where walk, I call them walkable streets. And uh, that's where I think we need to think in terms of working with the different disciplines. Uh, I happened to discover this street working with a traffic engineer. She and I went out and walked, uh, you know, and she walks, you know, with her baby. She walked there all the time, her carriage, uh, the stroller, I mean. So when you can take advantage of a street like that, but you ha there's a whole bunch of things you got to think about when you do that, it, you know, traffic speeds, traffic volumes. One thing I discovered in Buffalo too, that I was walking in the streets, but I noticed that the cars coming toward me would swerve way too much, but they did. The courtesy, the courteous ones, some would almost come right at me. And I worried about them because they'd go into the other lane. So you need to, you need to be consulting, I think, with the traffic engineers and thinking about that. On the other hand, these walkable streets are, you know, that other shot was walking around Denver. There's all kinds of places where you can do that very easily. Um, so it's part of that planning process. Uh, but, 
but it, it also, the beauty of it is in many ways, when we think beyond greenways, these are much more flexible than a traditional greenway that usually has to be engineered as a 10 foot wide hike bike path for a whole bunch of legal and design reasons uh, versus this more flexible uh, opportunity that might be here. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything that we haven't yet covered uh, that you really want to leave the audience with, Bob? You know, I think it's, it's been a good overview. I, I, I guess I come back to uh, two things as one, just emphasizing again, the, the experience and getting out and walking and making sure that it is a great experience for those people who are planning them for themselves or for for other people. And the other one is how you get these things built. Um, there's, there's a process for that. I've kind of learned in the Greenway business, you know, as my friend Mark Fenton, who is, he was the host of the PBS series, America Walks, he talks about the core of the pyramid of getting these things done is having good public policy you know, advocating for walkability and quiet streets and speed limits and safe pedestrian crossings. So I think those those policies are important. And then the next thing I think is is if you want to get these kinds of things built, don't don't be discouraged. Start with a process. Put together an image or a vision of what you want to see happen. Put a mission statement together. It's an elevator statement that kind of describes, and, and I kind of lay this out in the book, you know, what you want to do, and then kind of make an attractive package that can convey this. And then what you need to do, I think, is round up champions who are going to take this through the process. And a lot of times those are business leaders. They may be politicians uh, who are going to give you some wind at your back when you go to the various agency people. Uh, I mentioned think beyond silo thinking, build partnerships with people in the health community. Uh, that's got to be a huge emphasis, you know, to get these things done. And then build some viral projects that set an example and figure out a way to make those spread. And also cite examples of where people have done them successfully uh, other places and talk the money too, that they do bring in a financial return for the investment. So I would emphasize those kinds of things. Yeah. When you think back to examples that are out there um, in North America specifically, are there any that sort of bubble up? Well, yeah, there's one that's my favorite, uh, and it's the Turquoise Trail in Tucson. And that is a trail where it was two ladies with the historic group there, and they found some turquoise, turquoise paint that the city had left over from something, and they were somehow able to persuade the city to get one of their uh, street, you know, white line painters to take this paint and paint a stripe on the sidewalks in the old part, historic part of Tucson, that's a loop that goes around uh, that area through the old barrios, past the Spanish colonial architecture structures. It stops at some piazzas and restaurants. And uh, we have some friends that live in Tucson that told me about this when we first walked it. And we went out and walked it. And it was such a great way to experience um, old, tu there, there it is, old Tucson. Look at how simple it is. Um, you know, obviously the, they thought about the experience. They, they designed something that was a comfortable walk, uh, that had all kinds of points of interest. And uh, so I encourage people that's, you know, to go do that. But that's one of the examples that pops into my mind of sort of the, the, the one that bubbles up. The other one that's kind of, and I haven't actually walked it yet, is the uh, Maricopa Trail around uh, Phoenix, because that's one of the first grand loops that goes for hundreds of miles around uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and it connects together the, the various uh, county parks and open spaces. And so those are a couple of models that just just jump out to me as examples of grand loops and town walks that exist right now. Now, Denver is planning one that might cost $100 million, which is going to be kind of a deluxe version, which is awesome around downtown Denver. Oh, yeah. And think about the connections, too. Sometimes it's just a simple connection, uh, particularly with cul-de-sac 
types of communities. Uh, the policy should say those cul-de-sacs should have pedestrian connections. So if you want to visit the person in the house behind you, you don't have to drive five miles to get to them. You can just walk through a, you know, a connection like the one shown in the picture. Yeah. I laugh when I see these because it's just, it's so simple. It's so brilliant. And I've had uh, the opportunity to live in, in a couple different cul-de-sacs um, over my adult lifehood. And, and we always had pathways like this. We always had, you know, you know, little connectors. Uh, in fact, there in Colorado, uh, the house that I owned in Niwot, we had a, a nice little walkway that would punch through. And I've documented many uh, such pass-throughs and cut-throughs uh, in cul-de-sacs in Boulder, too. And so it really just opens up the possibility to be able to use existing infrastructure and still have it be car free. Yeah. And that, that really needs to be a requirement up front in the codes, as Mark Fenton said, in the policies, because building what you see in the picture would be impossible once the place is built. Because if you don't have those easements, people are going to say, not in my backyard, but if it's built, they love it. You know, so and, and I don't bl I don't blame them because, you know, at that point, if it's already built, it's not only is it not in my backyard, you're taking my backyard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whereas that's making their property more valuable, having those connections in the end at the end of the day. But you got to do it up front. It's got to be in the in the plans before they're approved. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. So one of the uh, things that you wanted to, uh, me to make sure to highlight, of course, was uh, America Trails, American Trails. Talk a little bit about this organization. Oh, yeah. They're a wonderful organization. Maybe I'm biased. I served as chairman of the board of American Trails for a number of years. Uh, I think they're the global go-to source for trails and walking and all that kind of information. And so it's, a, you know, if you go to their resource page and they have, they have wonderful webinars that they do. Uh, I've, I've hosted a number of them to learn about all the aspects of trails. So that's one good source. I think to get information and, and about the kind of things that I'm advocating too. They've, they've partnered up with uh, my publisher, Island Press, sponsoring webinars, that sort of thing. So that's another good source. The other source I was gonna mention and plug uh, is LinkedIn, um, is a way to, at least it's really worked for me. I'm not on the other social media sites, but I am on LinkedIn. And if you kind of start connecting with people in the areas that you're interested in, the, the post have just been amazing that I've been finding uh, through my, you know, my resources there. So those are, those are two things, maybe I'm eccentric, but those are two resources that I like, so that I like. Yeah. And I, and in fact, I, ha I have your, your LinkedIn page, you know, pulled up here. And, and so, yeah, uh, folks, this is a great way to uh, connect with Bob and be able to see what he's doing and stay on top of the things that you're posting because I'm glad that you found LinkedIn because, uh, you know, for Active Towns, uh, same thing. Uh, I make sure that I do uh, post all of my new content out to LinkedIn and uh, there's a lot of wonderful dialogue that's happening uh, out on this platform. So I'm really glad that you have found it and, and you're out there as well. Um, I also do want to uh, pop on over to uh, the the website for your your uh, your book here on Island Press again, folks. Uh, uh, be sure to pick up your own copy of Beyond Greenways, and I, I do have the the book out on uh, my bookstore, um, the the Active Towns bookstore, and so it's listed right here under uh, my featured authors. Uh, again, I I tend to interview quite a few folks who have written books, and so. Uh, uh, right there is the book as well. So, uh, Bob, it has been an absolute joy and pleasure having this conversation with you today. Thank you so much. Yeah, and you have a, you have a great day, and, and thank you very much for getting the word out. Hey, everyone, hope you enjoyed that episode with Bob Cerns, and if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below, and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts. Uh, there's many ways to do so. Easiest way is just to go to Active Towns. Dot org and click on the support button. And by the way, Patreon supporters get an extra added benefit of receiving this content ad-free and 
early each week. Uh, so please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. And again, thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Well, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.